morning, church family. How's everybody doing this morning? I hope you're doing well. Um, let's all stand together. We're going to praise the Lord this morning because He is great. Um, with the lights as well, we're going to praise. Here we go. Let's sing this. Who am I that the highest would well I was lost, but He brought me. Through the sun sets free, oh, he's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. We are free in him. Free at last, he has ransomed his grace.
Amen. We do praise the Lord for all that he's done for us. We want to worship him, give him all the adoration, all the praise that he and he alone deserves. So thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being a part of that, to worship together as a faith family. We welcome some of you back. It's so good every week to see some, some faces come back home to us, able to get back out uh, and worship with us. So welcome back for some of you. If you're our guest today, welcome to you for the first time or maybe the second, third, or fourth time as a guest, whatever it is, welcome and thanks for being a part of our faith family today. Those of you online, also, of course, we want to thank you for joining us faithfully each week and I pray that you are blessed as well. Let's keep worshiping together. Let's keep giving him the praise he deserves. Let's worship through our prayers, of course, our giving and continued singing, but as we do give do want to remind you about our Annie Armstrong emphasis offering. All of that goes to uh, North American Missions. We'll be receiving that offering the rest of this month through Resurrection Sunday. And, of course, if you need to give after that, we can do that as well. Our goal is $6,500 as a church, so hopefully we can do that. you be praying about what the Lord would have you give toward that offering. You may not be ready for it right now, uh, but in the coming weeks. There is a little envelope there in your bulletin you can use if you would like. Otherwise, just... Make sure you specify what it's for. For those of you who give online, there is a tab you can choose for Annie Armstrong. But let's pray together and let's worship through this prayer and giving. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We can declare it is well in our soul. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what you've done. And Lord, we pray for anyone in this room, anyone watching online, who can't declare that, Lord, because they don't know you. Lord, that they would hear something today. They would hear a word in a song or a word from a, uh, someone in this room or a word from the sermon today, Lord, that would just break their heart down. It would pierce their hearts, break the wall of sin, and bring them to life. And through that, Lord, they could truly declare it is well because of what you've done in their life. Lord, we've been talking for weeks now about salvation in, in different ways. And God, I hope and I pray that it's challenged each one of us and it will continue to challenge each one of us to open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to our lost friends, our lost brothers and sisters, family members, co-workers, neighbors. We all know lost people. We're surrounded by lost people. May it challenge us to live out our faith, share our faith, so that others would know. So that others would know exactly what you've done, know the grace you pour out freely, so that your kingdom will continue to advance because of the work done through this church. God, hear these songs lifted up to you in praise. May our hearts be genuine in everything we do. Receive these gifts, these tithes and offerings as an act of worship from each one of us. Now, Lord, we love you and praise you. All of this we do in Jesus' name. Amen. We lift up our great God. The splendor of
how God, oh, see how great, how great is our God. So we can sing how great is our God, but it's important that we understand why he's great. The song we're about to sing says this in the first line. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven he came running and there was mercy in his eyes. The gospel is why he's great. And this song, from his birth to his life to his death to his resurrection, walks us through Jesus, the gospel. So as we sing this, let's pour our hearts out to him and him alone, our salvation. Let's worship. In the darkness we were away without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and Christ. To a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. We praise the Father. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. He came and took the cross for us to reveal the kingdom of God. Oh, Lord, how great it is. What a joy that we have the awesome opportunity, the wonderful privilege to sing praise unto You this morning to fulfill the purpose for which we were made. And it is our joy to do so. Lord, we gather here this morning to worship You, to magnify, to exalt You, the King of kings. And so, Lord, as we worship, as we offer praise to You, Lord, we thank You for what You have accomplished in our lives. We thank You that we come not as fallen humans, but as resurrected men, women, children, coming to You, Lord, to worship the One who has made all the difference in our lives. You have changed us. You have transformed us. You are sanctifying us. And we worship You, O Lord. We praise You. 
for those here this morning, Lord, or those watching that may not have a relationship with You. Lord, we pray that You would come to them. That You would run to them this morning. That You would greet them. That You would open Your arms, Lord, that they might be healed and made whole. That they might see Your glory. Trust in You. Confess their sins. Turn from their sins. And receive Your forgiveness. Oh Lord, You have Your way in our midst this morning as we give You the praise and the glory, all adoration in Jesus' name. And let those who have come to worship say, Amen. Amen. Well, as you're seated this morning, I invite you to join me in Genesis, the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, as we look at the beginning of salvation. The beginning of salvation. As Passover approaches, I want us to direct our focus, I want to turn our eyes to the price of our redemption through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, on the cross. And as we begin to think of those things, we we want to go all the way back to the beginning. That's where we need to... If we're going to think of the cross, then we're going to go back to the beginning here in Genesis chapter 3. Look with me in verses 8 and 9. Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? You know, some have said that these are the saddest words ever uttered by God recorded here in verse 9. Where are you? Are you? That great preacher, Dr. W.A. Criswell, used to tell the story of a wise seminary professor, a preaching professor who would have his, who had his class stand one by one and read this passage, read this text. And there were some who, who read it as though it was just a question, just a simple question Where are you? Uh, there are, were those who read it as though God was angry. Where are you? There were those who read it as though God was indifferent. Where are you? And then one student stood and he read it with grief in his voice. With a sob. Where are you? The professor looked at that student and said, Young man, you will be a great evangelist. God has given you a compassion for the souls of men. And then speaking to the entire class, he said when God came into the garden in the cool of the day and called the man he had made, God was broken hearted as he asked where Adam was and what he had done. Why were the words of God so sad? Why was he so grieved? You need to remember first of all that Adam and Eve were the pinnacle of all that He had made. They were the pinnacle of all creation. Every time God created at the end of each day, He would say that it was good. God saw all that He made and it was good until He created man. And after He created man and He looked at His creation, He said it is very good. It is a form of completion. It was a form of satisfaction. Mankind was the pinnacle of God's creation. All that God had created was for the purpose of sustaining human life. That's why the earth has an appearance of age. Because it needed to sustain humanity immediately. Notice that everything God created, He created in adult form, in maturity. He didn't create an infant, He created a man. He didn't make seeds. He made plants and trees that were seed and fruit bearing. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? According to Scripture, the chicken. Because everything God made, He made in mature form. He did the earth the same way. The earth was made in such a way that it could sustain human life and animal life and plant life and all of those things immediately. There are those who would take us to task because we say that according to Scripture, the earth is less than 10,000 years old. And they say that's impossible. Well, let me remind you that nothing is impossible with God. But let me also tell you that God created all that He created in maturity. It was ready to go. 
It didn't need a million years or hundreds of thousands of years to cultivate and to marinate and to evolve and do all of those things. God made it ready because He was ready to put man on it. And man is the pinnacle of all creation. Some would say that we're arrogant, we're prideful for making that statement, but God is the one who said upon the creation of all things and finishing that with man that it was very good. Very good. In fact, humanity was His reason for creating anything because we are the only thing in all of creation that has been made in His image. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. He wasn't speaking to the angels because we're not made in the likeness of angels. This is a a conversation that takes place between the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in His own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, He created them. We're the only thing created in the image of God because we're the, we're the part of creation that He seeks relationship with. He created us for the purpose of relationship, for the purpose of communion, fellowship with God. And in that creation, they were happy. They were innocent. They enjoyed walking with God in the paradise that He had made for them. That was God's intention from the very beginning. We see throughout the book of Genesis, we see that Enoch and Noah and Abraham walked with God. That's what the Genesis record tells us about those patriarchs of the faith. And Adam had been created for the exact same purpose, the exact same reason to walk with God. But now, here in chapter 3, he's hiding among the trees. He's hiding from the Lord rather than walking with Him. So I want you to understand that the question is not a matter of location. It's not a matter of physical location. When God said, Adam, where are you? It's a matter of spiritual relationship. You see, the the truth still remains. God knew exactly where Adam was physically and spiritually. Just like He knows exactly where you and I are. I may be your pastor. I may be your spiritual leader. I may be your under-shepherd. But I can't look at you and discern where you are in your relationship with the Lord this morning. I can look at you, those that are gathered here, and I can know your physical location. I can know where you're at physically, but I don't know where you're at spiritually. And, And in the same regard, you can't look at me and know where I am spiritually. I may be standing on a stage preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you, you, there's no way for you to really know where I'm at in my personal relationship with the Lord this morning. But you know who does know? You know who's not perplexed? The Lord God Almighty. He knows right where we are. He knows where you are in your heart of hearts. In fact, He knows better than you know where you are in relation to Him and in that fellowship with Him or the lack thereof. And so there are those this morning that the question still remains that God is calling out to you. Where are you? Because you're not where you're supposed to be. You see, Adam was supposed to be walking with the Lord and he wasn't. Instead, he was hiding. And the reality is, is there are some here today, there are some watching at home. You're not where you're supposed to be. And God is calling out to you in grief. Where are you? The question is not for Him. The question is for you. In grief, God asks, where are you? And what have you done? You see, He continues there in verse 10. Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And the Lord God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Adam, what have you done? It wasn't that God didn't know what He had done. God knew exactly what He had done. That's why God was there. The question is for Adam, what have you done? Where are you, my son? 
And what have you done? And this takes us back to the beginning of sin. We can't talk about the beginning of salvation without talking about the beginning of sin. So let's go back to verse 1. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Satan had been created by God as an angel of light. In fact, he, he, many believe that he was the lead worshiper in heaven. That he was the, intended to be the worship leader of heaven. His name was Lucifer, which means light bearer. But he desired that which he was supposed to offer. He wanted that which others were giving to the Lord. He coveted the worship of God. And He de deceived many other angels Himself. And all of them were cast down. And as soon as He was cast down, along with those angels, He immediately went after that which God loved and treasured. The moment He got to earth, He went after the pinnacle of creation. He went after humanity. So you want to get at someone? You want to hurt someone? You want to tear someone down? Go after what they love most. God loved man. He loved man, humankind so much that He had made them in His own image. Lucifer had not been made in the image of God. The angels were not made in the image of God. Nothing was made in the image of God but man. Because God desired a relationship with humanity. So He made them in His image that they would be his representatives, that they would be His ambassadors, that they would shine forth His glory, that He would have a relationship with them. And so the enemy, Satan, was angered. He was upset by these things and he went after that which God loved, that which God treasured. And sin began with a question. He questioned the Word of God. Has God said, did God really mean what He said? Did God say what you think He said? Has God said? And He insinuated that God was holding out on them. And then He denied God's Word altogether, saying that the Lord was, dying, it was lying because of jealousy, because of selfishness. God just wants to keep all the wisdom to Himself. He's just holding back on you. He doesn't want you to know what He knows. Isn't that just like us today? We, we want more. We, we want our blessings and we want them now. We, we want our prosperity and we want them now. We want the good things and we want all of that. We want it now. We're like the prodigal son who went to his father and said, I, I want my inheritance not later, but now. I want it now while I can enjoy it. While I can do what I want to with it. While I've got all this, while I've got all this knowledge. I mean, I know more than you do, Dad. Go ahead and give it to me. That's exactly how we are. And we begin to question, has God said? I mean, we can read the Scripture, right? We know what the Word says, but we live in a different time. We live in a different culture. We, we, things, are, things are not the same as they were then, but the society has changed. These, these teachings are not popular. Surely this can't be true. Has God said? And we begin to interpret Scripture, not based on what Scripture says, not based on what God has said, but what we think or what our peers think or what others think. We commit the same sin that Eve committed. She fell into this temptation. 
She began to question God's Word herself. Has God really said? And then this digressed into sin. Notice the, the digression there in verse 6. She saw, she took, she ate, she gave, and he ate. It's just how sin happens with us. We see something, someone that we like. So we take it. And then we consume it. And then we give it to others. Come, enjoy this with me. Let's enjoy this luxury together. Let's enjoy this temptation together. And then they take as well. Misery loves company. And this transgression led to their humiliation in verse 7. Their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loin coverings. I want you to know that Satan's strategy has not changed. He's still whispering in your ear tonight. I mean today. Even now he's saying to you, Has God really said? Has God really said this truth or that truth? I mean, don't you know that's not popular? Don't, don't you know that that's not going to win you any friendships? Don't you know that that's not going to, that people are going to think you're weird, that people are going to think you're legalistic, people are going to think you're strange if you believe those things? If you live your life this way, they're going to call you judgmental. They're going to, in fact, they're going to oppress you. They're even going to persecute you because of what you believe. Surely that's not God's will. He's speaking that into our hearts even today. Has God really said? Causing us to question God's Word. I mean, after all, how can a God of love condemn anyone to hell or eternal judgment? God wouldn't do that. I want you to not believe His lies this morning. I don't want you to fall into His doubts. And if you have, I call you to repent this morning. If you have started to question God's Word, if you have started to question the truth of God's Word, then I call you to repentance and know that God's Word is eternal, that God's Word is true, that it will never fade, it will never pass away, that it is always timely, that it is not antiquated, that it endures every culture, every society, every generation. And that what is popular this day will pass away. What is in vogue this day will not be tomorrow. But God's Word will never pass away. So do not be deceived by the deceiver. In our text, I'll just point out how wonderful it is that the beginning of sin was immediately followed by the beginning of grace. Man sinned. They fell. She saw. She took. She ate. She gave. And He ate. And what happened? The Lord came. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The language of this passage implies that they had just got their fig leaf aprons on when they heard the sound of the Lord in the garden. He came to them and He came quickly. I mean, think about this. Adam and Eve had just rebelled against the Word of the Lord. Adam and Eve had just sinned against God. They had eaten of the tree that they had been told not to eat of. Some of us would ask, well, why did He put the tree there in the first place? Because that was their place to worship. You see, everything was available to them. Everything was open, but one. This was church for them. This was temple. This was tabernacle. This was their place to worship. Because everything was permissible, but one thing. One thing. That was the opportunity that they could come and say, we worship You, O God. We serve You. We obey You by not eating of the one tree among all the trees of the garden among all the things in your paradise, all the things in your creation that you have said we may partake of, this is the one thing. Here we worship you. And there they failed. 
They had rebelled against God. They had rejected His Word. They, they had fallen into deception. They had sinned against the Almighty. So what did God do? He came to them. He came to them. You know, I, I read that passage and, and, and I have to wonder, why did He destroy them? Why didn't He just turn them back into the dust from whence they came? Start over. Erase the chalkboard, so to speak. Why didn't He pour out His wrath? Why didn't He pour out His vengeance? Why, why wasn't He enraged at them for what they had done? He didn't come against them. He came to them. You know, we, we ask the same questions today. Why doesn't God destroy wicked people? Why doesn't He just take them out? Why not just take out the child molesters and the terrorists and the murderers? Why doesn't He just rid the earth of those evil people? Can I tell you that the answer today is the same as it was in Genesis 3? Because God is a God of grace. They broke His law. They violated His commandment. They rebelled against Him. And now they're hiding from Him. And what does He do? He comes to them. He is a God of mercy. A God of kindness. A God of love. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is a God of grace. They sinned against the Lord God Almighty and He immediately came to them to help them recover. He did not leave them in their sin. He did not abandon them. So His question was to call them to conviction. Adam, where are you, son? I remind you, He knew exactly where He was. But it's a call to Adam. It's a call to Eve. <laughs> it's a call to draw them out to repentance. Not to drive them out for judgment. Where are you? Where are you supposed to be? Why have you fallen? What have you done? You see, here we see God as the shepherd seeking the lamb who has strayed from the flock. It's here that we see God as the the father waiting for the prodigal to come home. You know what that, that word prodigal means? It means wasteful. He had been wasting his inheritance, wasting his life, wasting his time, wasting his energy, wasting his relationships, and all was lost. He returned home to give himself to his father as a servant. He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the Father is a gracious Father, a loving Father, a kind Father. And He says, oh no. No, go get a clean robe. And you put sandals on His feet. He was barefooted, which is a sign of slavery. It's a sign of poverty. He says, you put sandals on His feet and you put a ring on His finger. A sign that He is mine. And we say, well, He squandered His inheritance. No, it was just stuff. The real inheritance is the relationship. And here's what the Father said, still intact. Still intact. When God comes into the garden and He says, Adam, where are you, son? What He's saying is that on my end, I'm reaching out to you You've broken things off. You've run from me. You're hiding from me. But son, you're still mine and I'm here for you. Because God is a God of grace. He is the great shepherd. He is our Lord and our Savior. Why is God so patient with us? Why is He so patient with sinners? Why does He love them? were created in His image for the purpose of communion with Him. I, I can't answer fully the question of why He loves us. I just know that He does. And I know that this is the reality. 
that the blood of Christ, every drop, was worth to God one lost soul. For some of you in here this morning, you're saying, that was me. That was me. And for others, there are those in here that it could be you. Because God's asking you this morning, where are you? What have you done? I'm here for you. Because He's the God of grace. The beginning of sin is followed by the beginning of grace, which is then followed by the beginning of the gospel. There in verse 10, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? What have you done? And the man said, the woman you gave me, you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Adam's a real man. He throws his wife under the bus and then blames God for driving the bus. The woman you gave me, she gave to me and I did eat. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. In verse 14, he's speaking to the physical reptile. We don't know what that serpent looked like. And it doesn't matter. But we know that that physical reptile was cursed. But in verse 15... He's speaking to the dragon that had possessed the serpent. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. First of all, I want you to know that contrary to Satan's lie, Adam and Eve did die the day in which they sinned. They began to die physically but they died spiritually. That was an immediate death that day. And and all of their descendants have also received that death. We have inherited that death. As Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. <clears throat> and so he says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. According to the spirit of the air, he's making a reference to Satan. He's making a reference to the deceiver, to that dragon of old. But God came to them in grace and presented His plan for salvation, for their salvation and for ours in verse 15. And this is called the Proto-Evangelium. The first gospel. This is the first time the gospel is mentioned in Scripture. From the very beginning, you see, God knew that we would fall. God knew that we would sin. God knew that we would rebel. God knew that we would lose ourselves. So He provided a way for our redemption. He provided a means for our salvation from judgment. And that is the way of the cross of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The seed of the woman was the son of Mary. The bruising of His heel was the crown of thorns that was placed upon His brow. It was the beating, the flagellation that He took by the Roman lectors. It was the cross beam that He carried to Golgotha. It was the spikes that they drove through His wrist and through His feet. It was the spear that pierced his side. It was the tomb in which they put him in. That was the bruising of his heel. But I want you to know that his resurrection from the grave was victory over death and hell. And it crushed 
the head of Satan. He is victorious. But here's what I want you to know. That wasn't plan B. That that wasn't something that, that God put together on the fly. That sacrifice, that atonement for the sins of the world is the defeat that we were guaranteed from the very beginning. And here it is. From the very beginning in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3. This is why Revelation says that Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. That before there ever was anything, God made a way. You see, God knew that we would sin. He knew that we would fall. He knew what was going to happen. God is not subject to time. He transcends time. He sees the beginning and the end all at once. And He knew what would happen. So His plan from the very beginning was that He would provide a way. That He would provide a sacrifice. And that sacrifice would be the Lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Before the creation of anything, Jesus was coming to die for you and me. And so when we look at the cross, as we turn our eyes toward Passover, and the Lord's Passover Lamb fulfilled in Jesus Christ, please understand, please know, that it wasn't a backup plan. It wasn't plan B. It wasn't a way that God had to compensate for what had happened. It was God's plan from the very beginning. Because He made us to have communion and relationship with Him. But He knew that we would lose ourselves. And so you know what He did? He got ready to come to us. He got ready to come to us. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has done. He came. He came, born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, to be the perfect sacrifice for you and me. And every ounce of His blood, every drop of His blood, poured out on Golgotha for you and me. For you and me. Because God is a God of grace. It was known from the very beginning as the means of salvation that this, that this is how He would provide for us so that we might have eternal life. Now I cry out to you this morning, I tell you that there are some here this morning that you're not where you need to be. You're not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be walking with the Lord. You're supposed to be serving Him. You're supposed to be glorifying His name, but you're not where you're supposed to be. And you know it. You've tried to cover up your actions and your thoughts and your attitudes with fig leaves, but can I tell you something? They've withered away. And the Lord is walking here in our midst and He says this morning, Where are you? Oh, my son, my daughter, where are you? What have you done? I'm here. I came for you. Would you come out to me? And I'm waiting with open arms to receive you back again. Now, there may be some here that need to do that for the very first time this morning. That as the Lord calls out to you, where are you? What have you done? He's waiting. There are others that have answered that call before. They've walked with the Lord before. But they're not walking with Him now. You're not where you're supposed to be. He knows. And He's come anyway. And He says, where are you? What have you done? I've come for you. Come to me. So I invite you this morning, whether it's for the first time or the thousandth time, would you come to Him this morning? Because He's come for you. He knows right where you are. He knows exactly what you've done. And if you'll repent, He'll have you. 
Would you come to Him this morning? Brother Brian and I will be here on the front. The altar is open. Let today be either the beginning of salvation or let it be the renewal of that salvation. That you come to the God of grace who has come here today just for you. Would you respond in faith? Come as we stand and sing. Amen, for sure. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us online as well. I want to remind you of a few things in your bulletin. It uh, looks like we are going to have opportunity for missions this summer. We are so thankful for that. So excited to be back on mission. Uh, two things we've got right now. We're working on a student ministry trip to Baltimore uh, with our partner up there and also a trip to the Navajo uh, in June. So two of our Previous mission partners are, are back online, so to speak, and we're making those things happen. So if you want students to go, grades 7 through 12, get them signed up at the church website. And for our uh, work day, or for the Navajo, 
Uh, we have a work day this Saturday, the 20th. It's 7.30 that morning uh, to start prepping the firewood. So that will be at Jack Easterling's house. If you don't know where that's at, you can contact the church office this week, and we'd love to get you directions to that so you can help out to prep for that mission trip this summer. I hope you guys have a great week. Before we do, let's close one more song. Sing this chorus one more time. Praise the Father. Great Sunday, you are sick.